Good morning, church. We're so happy you're here worshiping with us this morning. Here are some announcements. We need you. We need you. We need you. By now, I'm sure you have heard our 30th anniversary weekend is coming up September 18th and 19th. And it's gonna be here, right outside. There's gonna be opportunities for the whole family, inflatables for the kids, a sound stage with live music all day, food trucks, and even an opportunity to maybe dunk one of your pastors. We can't do any of this without your help. So please check out the website at all the opportunities to volunteer or speak to somebody at the welcome desk today. We need, we need you. you. Today, September 5th, we have several ways for you to serve. There is a blood drive in the parking lot. Today begins our monthly food drive, but you can drop off food all week in the commons. We are taking a communion rail offering today for UMCOR's Haiti Relief. If you're not in a Sunday school class, visit the home page of the website to check out all the groups. Sunday school is a great way to connect. On Saturday, September 11th, the sanctuary will be open from 8 a.m. till noon for you to come in for a time of private prayer. Our adult senior ministry will host an old time rock and roll party on Wednesday, September 15th. The fun will begin at 1130. Our own Jim Connors will head the music. Midweek Connect begins September 22nd from 5.30 to 7.30. Dinner with family and friends, choir for children and adults, Bible studies for all ages. Check out the website for all the information. And now I would like to take a moment to ask you to check in because we want to know you're here. If you are joining us online, use the code that's on the screen. If you are joining us in the sanctuary, use the code that you'll see in front of you. Welcome church, we're so glad you're here. Please stand and join us in singing our processional hymn number 400 in the hymnals, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Christ Church United Methodist. We're so glad to have everybody gathered to worship uh, here in the sanctuary, and we welcome our online community as well. This is our time when we pass the peace of Christ one to another. 
Uh, if there's anyone here that's practicing social distancing, I have two sets of instructions for you. Uh, first, when we pass the peace of Christ, if you'll take this posture, we will respect that and not violate your distance. And second, uh, if you want to receive communion today in your pews, we have baskets in the back with uh, sealed communion kits, and you can grab one of those and have that, so if you're not comfortable coming to the altar, then uh, you'll be free from that. Let us greet each other now by passing the peace of Christ one to another. Peace be with you. Please join us in singing Christ for the World. We sing 568 in the hymnals. Almighty God, God, we come acknowledging you as our Redeemer. Lord, we long to worship and adore you this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. God, we know that in your presence there is fullness of joy. Renew our strength today. Restore our passion to be a vessel for you throughout every place in this world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. This is our faith. This is what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. On this Sunday, we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Therefore, let us get our hearts right to come to the Lord's table. You that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intent to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from this point forward in his holy ways. Draw near with faith 
and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, out of your great mercy you promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to you. Have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and lead us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news and repeat after me. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. There are a few times more special in worship than when a family comes up forward to have their children baptized, and we come to that moment in worship today. So I'm going to ask uh, Travis and Allison uh, Humphreys to bring their daughters, uh, Claire Ellen and Audrey Jane, as they come forward for baptism. And Pastor Ralph is going to teach us some of the symbolism of why we use water for baptism. So we use water in baptism. It's something that we seem to take for granted. If you've ever had your water turned off, maybe a hurricane came through or you've had a big freeze like we had at the beginning of the year, you suddenly understand the importance of water in our everyday usage. And the thing with water that we don't always understand is it's so freely available that we kind of take it for granted. But if we look at Scripture, we understand that water is actually a very powerful symbol for us. It symbolizes new birth. It symbolizes cleansing. It symbolizes life. It symbolizes forgiveness. And uh, it's a very, very important part of the Christian journey. In the Old Testament, you'll recall that in the first plague, the Nile, which was the source of life for the Egyptians, was turned to blood. If we see as well as the Israelites move out of and are delivered from Egypt towards their freedom, they walk through water, and we see the importance of that as well. And if you were one of those Israelites walking through the desert, you would have definitely been very interested to know where your next drink was going to come from. And uh, we see they had the same problem. They'd just been delivered from Egypt, and they found themselves faced with bitter water, and Moses throws as a branch into the, the water and becomes sweet. We also see in the desert how water came from the rock because if we can't turn on our taps and we can't just have easy access to water, well, where does it come from? And so we see how God is the source of our life and he is the source and our provision. New Testament, we see it as a very strong symbol as well. We see water is, uh, is used in baptism. We see it in Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, we also see it in Romans chapter 6, where it speaks about freedom from sin as water is given and shown as a part of the baptismal process. There's nothing more exciting for us than when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he speaks of, unless somebody is born of water and the Spirit, we cannot experience new birth. And then I think it's chapter 7, where he says, I am the living water. You can come to me. You can, if you believe in me, you can come and drink. And his streams of living water will well up. And so we use water, very important symbol. I'm going to pour it out. We're supposed to get a really good sense of what it sounds like as it splashes. I don't think you're going to hear it, but I can. <laughs> and it is there for us, not only as water, but as a symbol of life, a symbol of new birth, something that cleanses something that welcomes us into the family of God.
Claire and Audrey, I'm going to ask each of you a question, one or two questions. We talked about this the other day, remember? So, Claire, I'm going to ask you, do you love Jesus? Yes. And is it your desire to be baptized today? Yes. And Audrey, do you love Jesus? Yes. Is it your desire to be baptized today? Yes. Very good. Okay, I'm attempting to stand with the robe. There we go. <laughs> uh, Travis and Allison, obviously, uh, Claire and Audrey have given consideration to their life of faith and trust you, and the church trusts you, and God trusts you to guide them in that. And out of that trust, I want to ask you some questions, and if you agree, you would say, uh, I do or I will. <laughs> On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin. Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do. do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Will you nurture Claire and Audrey in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Yeah. All right. I'm going to come over here. Let's going to leave the bowl here, and we'll bring y'all closer to the water. Y'all come on. Yeah. There we go. All right. We're going to start with Claire, okay? Are you ready to be baptized? You're going to lay hands with me. Get, get to a place where you can lay hands. Claire Allen, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may God's richest blessings continue to fill your life as you grow and mature as a disciple of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Very good. And Audrey? Audrey Jane, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may God's richest blessings continue to fill your life as you grow and mature as a disciple of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, we as a church take responsibility for these newest baptized members of the Christian community. And Pastor Melinda is going to ask you some questions to respond to. Brothers and sisters of the household of faith, I commend you to your love and care, these children, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that these children may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ. That this child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in a way that leads to eternal life. Say a word about uh, children in our church. Our biggest responsibility is to pass the faith on from one generation to the next. And Claire and Audrey are uh, examples of that being passed on. They are going to be in our Sunday school classes and our children's choirs and our vacation Bible schools. They may be seen running up and down the halls when they're not supposed to. They might be seen eating half a box of donuts when their parents aren't looking. <laughs> they might even get a little noisy in church. And you know what? That's okay. Because children are life. God sent these children to our care, and we are here to love them to maturity. Would you welcome them now to the church? And we have for each of them, these are their Bibles and their baptismal certificates. So let's see here. Uh, Claire, this is yours. And Audrey, you. you're welcome. All right, thank you all very much.
Isn't this a great time to go into a time of prayer? <clears throat> Will you bow your heads with me as we just take a moment of silence and come before the Lord? Let's pray. thank you, God, that we can be a part of your family. Your scripture teaches us that we are not foreigners, we are not aliens, we are not far off, but we are members of your household. We celebrate this baptism this morning, but God, we celebrate every member of this family. And it is my prayer, God, that even as we come before you in prayer, that you would reveal your love. Reveal your grace. I pray, God, that even in this place, you would open our eyes to see that we are family. Give us the wisdom to know how to be there for one another. Give us the wisdom and the understanding to know how to love when love seems difficult, to care where care seems difficult, to sacrifice when it really may feel like the last thing we want to do. May you always be before our eyes as the example of love, of acceptance, of grace, of forgiveness, and of life. We thank you, Jesus. Will you join with me as together we Pray as the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, a lot is happening in the life of the church, and today it is a great privilege to introduce the second of four videos as we prepare for our 30th celebration, if you'll have a look at the screens right now. Well, according to the interfaith arrangements of the Woodlands with the development company, uh, the Texas Annual Conference purchased five acres of land that they were going to deed over to the church to build its first building. That's a great thing. We're called a room to grow church at the time. Those were the funds used uh -huh. to get that land. The only problem was it was in a real bad location. And you couldn't get to it. Relatively well, speaking. The, there wasn't even a road right. there. The road, yeah. when we got here, the road, Research Forest, ended at Shadowbin. And then it progressed a little bit to... Uh, no, it was up the... It was up a the little trillion, further. Up yeah, the trillion, up the trillion. Okay, yeah, you're yeah. right. Okay. But we, we still I couldn't get right. here. Thank That's right, thank you. <laughs> and... Um, we, we worked and we began a capital campaign and we raised uh, a half a million dollars in three-year pledges and uh, we decided to take on some debt so we could build basically our first facility which was going to be 13,000 square feet of multi-use, multi-purpose mm -hmm. worship space. And, uh, but we knew the land wasn't enough for the dream, the vision that we would felt like God had given us. So we spent a lot of time trying to, trying to relocate. And uh, in 1994, while we were planning our first building, Conroe ISD had a bond election for a brand new high school. Uh, and it was going to be called the Woodlands High School. And Conroe had been given a certain amount of land to buy. And they only wanted 79 acres and there were nine acres of land left over and the company didn't know what to do with it. So they approached us mm -hmm. and we bought this land, traded the five acres for this land, the nine acres. And oddly enough, or by the serendipity of God, 
This property is in the geographic center of the woodlands. If you put a compass on a map and you try to find the center, it will end. The center point is on Millennium Forest between the high school and the church. So here we are in the center of the community and to know that it's Christ's church at the heart of this community. Oh, yeah. I've always liked that. I've always thought that was a, a great thing. So we began the process of building our, our first building in what was supposed to be a nine month project took 16 Forever. months. Forever. Rain and rain, and, uh, but we finally got it up. And Christmas. the end of 1995 was coming. Remember, and we, and we were gonna have to have another Christmas Eve in the community center and I just said, no. no. We're not going to do that. So with chain link fence around the property and an unfinished parking lot. An unfinished hallway. Unfinished I mean, hallway. Remember? We had carpet down the hall and the sanctuary is finished. We had church on Sunday, December the 24th. And remember that we had our first alive nativity. Jeff our first and I, live Jeff nativity. Jeff Pinkerton yeah. and I put together and got people to do the live nativity. It was great. And it, yeah, we it had was great. Uh, two services in the morning. Uh-huh and five services in the evening. And I remember you saying, is every Christmas going to be like this? <laughs> but it was great. <laughs> yes, and and every then, Christmas. And so mm -hmm. we, we started our, our journey here on this property and we watched it grow and develop. We got to watch the high school being built. But more importantly, we began new ministries that we knew only yes. the building could have. We began the preschool in 1996 which is still in ministry today. Think of the countless young lives that they began their education journey mm -hmm. uh, here. And uh, we began support programs like Al-Anon and AA and things to reach uh, human need. And uh, The building really did provide a, a place for all of those ministries mm -hmm. that we were able to do. Isn't that exciting? We live in the blessing and the generosity of those that have gone before us. And uh, with that, I want to thank you for your generosity here at Christ Church as we also give generously to make way for the generations to come. If you came ready to give today, there is a basket at the back. At, on your way out, you can just give um, and just leave it in the basket until it get to where it needs to be. If you are watching online or you prefer electronic online giving, we encourage that as well. Go to our website, click on Give. It'll take you through steps, and that'll help you with the giving there as well. Let's bow our heads and thank the Lord for all He's done and for His generosity in our life. We thank you, God, not only for today, but we thank you, God, for those that have gone before us. We thank you for the kindness, the goodness, and the generosity of people who had vision to see ahead. We pray, God, that even as we give, as we step forwards in our lives, giving of our time and of our, of our effort, of our resource, Lord, that we too will have vision to see ahead, to see generations that are to come. And as we give, may it be that your kingdom grows and that people will find a spiritual home. They'll find life in this community, we pray. Amen.
seated. In the time of the early church, it was very common in culture and society for people to differentiate themselves among class and position. Rich and poor were separated in almost every area, freed and slaved, soldier, non-soldier, citizen, non-citizen. It was how order was kept. It was the way of things. So James is writing the church to say, not in the church. In the church, we will not have such distinctions. Live differently from the rest of the world. And then he begins to uh, point out and paint a picture of what that can look like in James chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 10 and verses 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really, really believe in our gracious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in the faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable, has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. This is the word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. was our bishop in residence, and she saw a disturbing trend taking place in our conference, and the trend was this. We had a very uh, long and nearing retirement, and we had a very smaller population of younger clergy coming in behind them. Not only was it going to create a, a shortage of pulpit priester, preachers, it was going to create a shortage of experienced leadership. And so in her wisdom, she decided to start a leadership program. She and the cabinet began to look at the profiles of their young clergy and pick some to be put through a five-year program called Advancing Pastoral Leadership. And in that five years, the idea was to kind of take what experience couldn't give them and give them training and community and equipping so that in the next five years when we get hit with what we were calling the retirement tsunami, we have some people with some leadership skills to step into those positions. By the grace of God, and somebody must have been confused, uh, I, I got picked for that first group. Now, how did they define young clergy? They had to come up with a, a metric for that, so they said, anybody who can give at least 25 years of service before retirement can be young clergy. Mandatory retirement was 72. I made the cut by six months. I was 45, 46, whatever the math is there. Went, interviewed, wrote the papers, got accepted, and I was the oldest pastor in the young advancing pastoral leadership group. If you know Jason Burnham, he and I were in the same group together. Um, Jason still looks like he's 20. but uh, So we have our training together. And word gets out through the denomination that Bishop Hugh is doing this new thing. And so we end up being interviewed and people talking to us within the denomination. We're invited to go to General Conference in Florida and host a young clergy gathering. And each one of us was to be a table host to talk about this program and what it does for us. And since you're, I'm the oldest guy in the young clergy group, I sat down with some clergy from Florida. And one of them very awkwardly said... Uh, so how does your conference define young clergy? <laughs> I was like, shut up, kid. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> Program finishes. While this is going on, at annual conference, they were starting to promote young clergy gatherings so that young clergy could learn from each other and encourage each other and develop deep connections. And so there was always one night in annual conference when all the young clergy were invited to come, and we went and helped start that, and we all looked forward to that time of fellowship for young clergy. Uh, and then uh, one year, I didn't notice until annual conference was coming, I didn't know the date of the young clergy gathering. So I contacted some of my peers that were in advancing pastoral leadership, said, hey, I, where's, when is the young clergy gathering? Where is it going to be? And none of them responded back. I had to find out from somebody else, you're no longer young clergy. They kicked me out. And they didn't even have the courage to tell me. Stupid kids. <laughs> and I got to admit, 50-ish is a little old to be young clergy, and, but I was, that was my group, and I felt a little excluded. It made sense. It was right. It wasn't an earth-shattering experience. But I felt exclusion. 
I felt that I wasn't, uh, was, I was no longer like them. I was different from them. I was other than them. I was, was, was inside. I am now on the outside. When James is writing to the church and he talks about how there should not be distinctions among you. We live in such a meritocracy and such an egalitarian culture that the idea of you know, somebody rich getting preferential treatment versus somebody poor getting less uh, good treatment, it, it, it almost, we can just feel how wrong that is. And so, uh, but, but back then, that's how things were. To be honest with you, Somebody who is poor coming into the church, if they're invited to sit among the rich and sit where the rich sit, they would be very uncomfortable. It's not just that the rich wanted to stay where the rich stayed. The poor didn't want to be with the rich because it felt wrong. This is a radically different type of community, and I want you to hear that. This isn't just about we shouldn't treat poor people worse than rich people or this, that, and the other. It is a totally countercultural movement, and it was a struggle for everybody in the Christian community, rich and poor, slave or free. All of those classes being told, do not keep distinctions among yourselves. That's part of, it was one of the big hurdles of the early church, but once we crossed it, and people got to see what it really was like to live in authentic community, where all human distinctions are stripped away for our commonality with our fellowship with Jesus Christ, it was something different and special. And soon people were willing to tear the, down, the, the, the walls down on a house church to become a part of that because it was something that no one had ever seen before. There are several reasons why James wants to cast this vision of the church being the place where we don't have distinctions. One of them is that James is absolutely convinced that everybody has something to bring to the table. Everybody, rich or poor, strong or weak, old or young, everybody has something that Christ can use to share the love of God. There was a college president at a small private school just outside of uh, Philadelphia that had to come into the city of Philadelphia for a fundraising meeting with alumni. He hated fundraising meetings, and he really didn't like going into Philadelphia either. But he knew what he had to do as a college professor, so he put on a suit and tie, and he uh, you know, gets out of his cab, and he's walking down the Chestnut Street in Philadelphia to make his way to where these alumni are waiting to hear his presentation, and he's just as tense as can be. And he looks up, and he sees a homeless person uh, a, a few yards away heading in his direction, and he does what a lot of people do. Well, if I don't make eye contact, you know, this and the other. But the guy looks at him and says, hey, mister, hey, mister. I couldn't ignore him. He said, yeah, what's up? And he said, the man was holding a cup of coffee from McDonald's. He said, you want some of my coffee? And he wanted to be polite, and so, okay, and he took the coffee cup out of these very dirty hands, and he sipped some of the coffee and thanked him and handed it and said, so what's going on with you that you're wanting to share your coffee today? And he said, you know, the coffee is especially good this morning. And I believe that when God gives you something good, you ought to share it. And he thought, here it comes. This is when he's going to ask me for money. And he's sizing this man up, and his clothes are filthy, and his beard is long and scraggly, and he can see rotten pieces of old food in his beard, and it's not a pretty picture. His teeth not looking pretty, and he can get a smell. You ought to share when, somebody's, you give, when God gives you something good. And, and he says, well, what can I offer to you? And the man says, give me a hug. And in that moment, he thought, I, I wish he'd asked for $5. <laughs> so he steps in to do a little hug, and the man embraces him with a bear hug and doesn't let go. And it feels really awkward at first. Here's a man in a suit and tie being hugged by a large man with a large beard homeless person and then he hears a voice saying to him I was hungry and you gave me food I was naked and you gave me clothing I asked you for a hug on Chestnut Street and you accepted it 
and the embrace ends and he walks out back to his meeting with a peace he'd never known in a long time. I was just hugged by Jesus, by a homeless man. Jesus loved me through that man. Jesus can love people through all other people. Jesus makes the decision on whom he chooses to love and the people he chooses to love us through. When we make distinctions, we tend to try and negate what Jesus is going to do. I'm going to show you something now that you haven't ever seen in church. I don't think you've seen this before in church. Um, It's a picture of what it can look like when people that maintain distinctions find a way to break them down. It's a video, and it's a beer commercial. I would describe my political views as the new right. I say that I'm left. Feminism today is man-hating. I would describe myself as a feminist 100%. I don't believe that climate change exists. We're not taking enough action on climate change. I think it's about time these people got off the high horse and started looking for credible problems that actually exist. It's absolutely critical that trans people have their own voice. That's not right. You can't, you know, you're, you're a man, be a man, or you're a female, be a female. Women do need to remember that we need you to have our children. Could I be friends with someone that says the women's place is in the home? Um... <laughs> Right, okay, well, I'm an expert at flat packs. If you have any trouble, just watch me. So it looks like I've got your instructions here. I think so. Let me help you. It's not just that bit there. Describe what it is like to be you in five adjectives. Okay, frustrating. Dedicated. Opinionated. Lucky. Ambitious, offensive, solemn. I have ups and downs. Strong. I don't want to say attacked, misunderstood. Name three things you and I have in common. We're both male, we're both confident, and we're both loudly spoken. We know each other better than people who've known each other for 10 minutes should. You seem quite ambitious and positive, and you've got this really, um, got a glow. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Your aura is pretty cool. I'm sensing. Are you. Uh, former military or something? People have said that, but there is no, really? there is no history. So are you then Ex- ex-military? Um, yeah. If you're ex-military, I'm very proud of you already. Well... So. I grew up uh, in a bit of a rough state. I've experienced homelessness. I've known what it's like to have absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm definitely most grateful just, just for life. We've only just met, but I think you're the sort of person that would listen to me and we'd have a discussion rather than argue. Yeah, you could hang out with, man. Let's go. My chance. Goodness sake. You're right, mate. Fitter than a look. Perfect. Oh, yeah. There you go. It's basically, I think we just bought a bar. Yeah. Okay. Here you are. <laughs> Each take a bottle and place it on its corresponding markings on the bar. Attention. Please now stand to watch a short film. Feminism today is definitely an excuse for misandry, man-hating. If somebody said to me that climate change is destroying the world, then I'd say that is total piffle. So, transgender, it is very odd. We're not set up to understand or see things like that. I am a daughter, a wife. I am transgender. I feel like the battle for feminism definitely isn't done. The fight is never going to be over, if I'm honest with you. You now have a choice. You may go, or you can stay and discuss your differences over a beer. I'm only joking. (laughs) (laughs) You're happy for a second, then. Well, I'm having a drink. I'm having a drink. Yeah. I want to discuss. Beer. Yeah, beer and discuss. 
cheers. At the end of the day, mate, about I've reaching out to people. With you. Yeah, and you know, even if you wanted to convince people about your point, the productive thing to do would be to sit it's down. Engage. And have a it's engage. It's engage. I've been brought up in a way where everything's black and white, but life isn't black and white. Yeah, I'm just me. <laughs> yeah. Smash the patriarchy. <laughs> I'll give you my mobile number, you give me yours, uh -huh. and we'll keep in touch. I'd have to tell my girlfriend that I'll be texting another girl. <laughs> she might be a bit upset with that, but I'll have to get round there. I'll have to tell my girl that she'll have to lump it. Yeah. It can happen around a bar, and it can happen around a communion table all the more. Most of what differentiates us isn't our social status. It's our opinions on issues and our political alignments. And yet, we have Christ in common. Let us come to the table and unite around Christ. Would you prepare your heart for the sacrament of Holy Communion? With you. Where are you doing the prayer? Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The night to which he gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. We feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. say
brief word about Holy Communion and the United Methodist Church. In the United Methodist Church, we do not believe that this altar table belongs to us. It belongs to Jesus. So you don't have to be a member of our church today to receive communion. So if you're Methodist or Baptist or Roman Catholic or Church of Christ, or if you're not anything at all, but you're seeking to love God and live in fellowship with your neighbor, then you can have communion with us today, and we hope that you will. Uh, some instruction for everybody. If you'd rather not gather around the table, we have a basket at the back with uh, communion elements packaged in a baggie if you'd like to experience the sacrament back in your pews. We also have a basket uh, with gluten-free Oh, it's right here. We have it gluten-free right here. We'll have that available uh, as well. The ushers will invite you to come forward pew by pew uh, to receive the sacrament. Uh, and so we will now invite our communion steward stewards to come forward as we offer to serve communion together.
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it's not by our merit, but only by your grace that we come to your table. We thank you for being here with us, for abiding in us, and for sustaining us. Give us the grace to learn to live with each other, holding all that we hold in common, and all that we hold in common is you, Lord. Amen. We don't ever want to end worship without inviting someone to become a Christian, and I want to make that invitation at this time. If there's anyone here who's never given their life to Christ would like to do so, I'll tell you how to do that. All you have to do is pray a prayer that goes something like this. Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and be the Lord of my life. If you pray this prayer or something like it, we believe your life is totally and forever changed. And you can come forward today to be baptized or come talk to Pastor Ralph, Pastor Melinda, or myself about what that means. But if anyone wants to join our church today by baptism or transfer from another church, I invite you to come forward as we stand and we sing together. Please join us in singing hymn number 430, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you as you live your life for him and for each other. Amen.